Welcome back. This is the Big Blue Banter, New York Giants football podcast. I'm Dan Schneier, joined as always by my co-host Nick Filato. Tonight, we're finally here to do a mailbag. I think it's been like a month since our last mailbag. Mailbugs are my favorite show by far, so I don't know what's taking us so long. But without further ado, let's dive right into this thing. We got a lot of questions and not all the time in the world, so we're going to try to get as many in as possible. If we miss some, we'll hit it maybe uh, tomorrow or next week. So let's start here with Bowman Klein, who asks... Is the leadership so committed to the rebuild that they would go without Daniel Jones or a 2023 rookie quarterback from the draft for the 2023 season? This is assuming that they didn't want to pay Jones and don't believe that they can get their guy in this specific draft. Would ownership let them go that route? I'm curious about that. I'm not 100% certain if they would. The ownership loves Daniel Jones so much, and as we've said so many times, I don't know the market on Daniel Jones. I think he can get paid a fair amount for what Daniel Jones is worth, and they'd be willing to bring him back on a one-year deal until they find their long-term guy. So I don't know if they just let him walk unless there's a team out there that's going to blow him away with a contract, which I don't really envision. Yeah, it's a really interesting question. I think from what we've been told, John Mara regrets his last run you know, with Dave Gettleman and all the power that he gave him, but also that his saying it like John Mara felt like I was meddling too much. And he basically said, like, I am going to turn this thing over to this new regime, let them do it their way. And so I do think to answer your question, that ownership would let them. And I know a lot of Giants fans find it crazy, but if this current group, Dable and Shane do not believe that Daniel Jones has what it takes to take the next jump, if they improve his wide receivers and offensive line, and that is a very real possibility, despite what people might want to say, we don't know what they're thinking. They're looking at this from a different frame. They might believe that if they believe that I think they will be comfortable going with Tyrod Taylor next year. There's a lot of Giants fans on Twitter who I see like flooding comments with like Taylor sucks. Taylor's the worst thing ever. And I don't really know what that's based on. They're so definitive and so strong in their belief that Taylor can't operate within this system and do some of the things Daniel Jones has done. I don't know if he can. I don't know if he can't either, though. Like, I just don't know. We haven't seen Tyrod Taylor in the system. He played a few snaps last week. In a few snaps, like a, a game, you know, a few games before when Jones got hurt that one week, then he got hurt. So I don't know if they really believe that. I also don't know if they care. I don't know if their thought is we need to get, you need to keep the momentum going for 2023. They may look at this 2022 season like we won seven games early. We lost a lot of games late, especially if they lose to Washington. We lost a lot of games late. We are just not quite there yet or anywhere close. We don't need to focus so much on, you know, Da, 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 moving it a little better than 2022. We need to focus on what is our bet? How is our bet? How do we get to become as fast as possible a team that wins 11, 12, 13 games every year and compete for a Super Bowl? That's the goal for Joe Shane. I know that's his goal. It's a goal for every GM. And so if that go, if the way for them to get there is to not put cap space into Daniel Jones in future years, like, okay, if it's a franchise tag, that's one thing, right? They may feel like they can backload some other deals with Lawrence and things of that nature, Andrew Thomas and just kind of like front load a Jones deal for one year, and that's it. But if you're talking a two- or three-year contract where there's dead cap moving on in 2024 and 2025, if they don't believe in him ever getting to that level, they're not going to do that. Like, that's just simple to me, at least. They're not looking at it like, Daniel Jones played really good in this system, but we asked him to do. We won eight games. Let's bring him back because we have no other options. I don't even know why that's a conversation, though. Of course they're not going to do that. But a like, lot of people, but yeah, but I would think of that's probably a contrary. What, what would motivate them to do that? Well, yes, what would motivate can... them to do that is if they think that they don't have any better options, which is what Bowman's saying, which is one, they don't believe in Tyrod. But cause... you can still give him a contract while not also absolutely damaging your future cap and causing future years to have a dead cap. That just doesn't seem like a prudent idea if you're not fully bought into Daniel Jones, which this regime is not. They've made that clear. That doesn't mean they hate him. That doesn't mean they won't bring him back next year, but they're not fully bought in to Daniel Jones at this point. Like, I don't think that's controversial to say. No, it's not controversial to say if they were fully bought in, they would have extended him or picked up the fifth year option. Exactly. Now the argument could be made that they are fully, they weren't fully bought in before the season. And now with what they've seen on film, they are fully bought in and we'll see that in the off. This is th that side of the argument. I'm not, I'm not making this. No, I know, I know, but I'm saying in the off season, we'll see that play out in this, in this argument's mind, which is they'll sign him to this big deal. Or they'll give him like three years, 70 million or whatever it would be. Um, but I think honestly, any dead cap, I think they have to look at, they will might, they might look at this. If they don't believe in him, like if they don't believe that giving him all these receivers and offensive line and blah, 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 will make him be help. will you know, make him a, a, a perennial Super Bowl contender. 
or sorry, make the Giants a perennial super contender with him as quarterback. I don't really think they're going to dump any cap into it because even if it's like a small two or three year deal, dude, there's still going to be dead cap in 2024 and 2025, and they're not going to want that if they don't believe in him. And so to answer your question, Bowman, it's, it will seem crazy on the surface if they don't draft someone after letting Daniel Jones go to a lot of these rabid fans who aren't really, in my opinion, like taking everything into perspective. But if you actually just think about it and take a step back, don't force your quarterback in the 2023 draft if you don't feel like you're confident in one of these guys becoming your next quarterback. And worst case scenario, if you have to go into a season with Tyrod Taylor and someone else at quarterback and no cap basically allocated there, it's not that bad because it's unless you believe that Daniel Jones in year two of this system can just take whatever they can add in the offseason and free agency and, and um, the draft to becoming this Eagles like team. If you believe that, then and if they believe that they should and will resign Jones. If they don't believe that, though, there's not that much upside. There's not that much downside to going with Taylor and another quarterback next year because they don't feel this roster is ready yet to compete for a Super Bowl. I feel like it would send a sign to the fan base that they're tanking almost if they were to do that. I don't know if that's fair or if it's unfair. I don't agree with that, though. I mean, Tyrod Taylor hasn't taken more than 200 dropbacks since like 2017. Like he doesn't have a lot of experience under his belt in recent years of him like starting and things of that right. nature. He's had a bunch of tough breaks, too. You go to Cleveland, he ends up getting benched for Baker Mayfield against the Jets on Thursday night football. You end up going to Los Angeles, the whole doctor situation with the lungs and that right. entire mess. But he's also a 30, he's going to be 34 next year. And he's like six, he's hardly six foot one. He's, he's a smaller quarterback. I think it right. would be perceived that way by a lot of giant fans. And I don't think it's unfair to perceive it that way. I, so like, I don't, I know what you're saying and I don't think it's unfair to perceive it that way, but I don't know if it's like that, um, I guess, um, black and white, like you're either tanking or you're not tanking as a franchise. I think sometimes like with Daniel Jones, for example, if you bring him back, they, I'm not saying this is what I think by the way, and I'm not saying this is, I know, you know, I'm just saying to the people listening and I'm not saying this is what the giants think either, but they may view it as we don't really see a point to putting cap into 2024, 2025 and Daniel Jones, if we don't ever see him getting to this level. So what do we really have to lose by going to Taylor? It's not, it's, it's tanking and it might be viewed as tanking in a sense, but they may not view keeping Jones as not tanking. They may view that as eh, out of this. What's the point? Like, is there any real point to trying to grind to nine wins? I don't know if that helps you long-term and there could be a case made by a lot of people that will actually hurt you long-term. If you put cap into 2024 2025 maybe even 2026 and daniel jones and he doesn't work out that is hurting you you're better off not signing him going with taylor it's not tanking if it's better for your future in my opinion and yes tanking the current season maybe or making yourself worse for the next season sure i do believe daniel jones gives them a better chance to win than tyra taylor but i'm not really sure their focus should be who gives them a better chance to win it should be who can get that how can they get to this level and that's at the real cost question. at what cost, too, at what until, cost? They, until they can get to that level, which right. I feel like is a completely fair thing to have a conversation about in terms of Daniel Jones. Like, is there a way you can structure these contracts, which we've seen around the NFL where you can have that one year out and you're not tied right. up from a dead cap standpoint? Because that's what I feel like is the best um, allocation of funds towards towards a quarterback like Daniel Jones, who you may not be fully sold on, but he's still young and he has upside and he's athletic and a second year in the system and yada, 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 you know, right move the roster around him. Can he develop? Like, I don't think there's any delusions of grandeur about Jones right now that he's just going to automatically turn into Justin Herbert, right? Like, I don't think that's within his range of outcomes, but can he be a good enough quarterback to lead you to the playoffs consistently? And I think that is the conversation that giant fans and people who cover this team should be having. And so far, if you read between the lines and the tea leaves, it doesn't appear like Joe Shane and Brian Day will believe that at the beginning of the year when they did not extend his fifth year option. We'll have to wait and see if those conversations heat up at the end of this season. They didn't do it during the bye week. That doesn't necessarily mean, though, that they're not interested because they could be on good terms with his agent. Who, who exactly knows what's going on in terms of extending him? But I don't think they're going to give him a huge contract, as we've said several times in this podcast. It just doesn't make any sense. Yeah, for sure. And it's interesting because I think since the season started, the last we heard from Joe Shane, it was pretty effusive in his praise for Daniel Jones. I don't expect to me, I don't read too much into this anyway, because I don't expect them to say anything bad about their quarter. That's just never going to happen. It's yeah. not how this operates. But he did say he's performed well and got to have it moments. He referenced the Green Bay drive, which he really liked. And that was an amazing drive. But then you also have to factor in that that was midseason and he may have a different opinion at the end of the season. We don't know. 
it's really going to be a lot of speculation and it's going to be a lot, not speculation. It's going to be a lot of um, prognostication from Shane and Dable, right? They have to decide if we get the right O-line and the right receivers around Jones, can he be a top five, top 10 quarterback? Because if not, it's going to cost you way too much to even get that around him. You're going to have to spend cap on old line. You're going to have to spend cap on receivers. You're going to have to spend draft assets on both. And then you're not going to really have the cap space to keep them all because you have to allocate that money to Daniel Jones. See the Tennessee Titans, see the Minnesota Vikings, see the um, Oakland Raiders, the Vegas Raiders. And even the Vikings, people are like, well, the Vikings are doing really good this year. Does anyone really think they're going to win a Super Bowl? Does anyone really think they even have a chance to win a Super Bowl? I do not. I watched that team get walloped by the Lions. Their defense is pathetically bad, and their defense is bad because they haven't had the assets and the resources to, to get a defense together because they have so much cap space allocated to Kirk Cousins. The same crap is going on with Tennessee. They're way over the gap for their future, and they're in really bad cap health going forward because of Tannehill's contract, because of Henry's contract. And then in Vegas, they're not even a playoff team with Derek Carr. So, you know, it's... That's the other side of it. And it's, do you want to go that path? Is that path even worth going just to say, I don't know, we competed. We almost made the playoffs this year. And even if they do make the playoffs, is it worth trying to not go backwards to go? For, do you have to take a step backwards to go forwards? is the big question that they're going to have to answer. It's so funny, man. It's what week 15 right now. And we're already having these conversations, which there's nothing wrong with having these conversations yeah. in week 15, in my opinion, but it just is a little glimpse into what the off season is going to hold for all of us. Oh, and yeah. I'm, ex I'm excited for the, uh, for the Twitter timeline to say the least. And Bowman, though, we become like a dominant team again, Nick, I'll always enjoy these forward looking 30,000 foot view discussions more than the, than the other stuff. I'm going to be honest because once we become dominant, like if we're the chiefs right now, Oh, I'd love to talk chiefs ball all day. Oh my God. Did you see that throw by Mahomes? Can you believe he was able to generate that velocity? Wow. Did you see Mahomes read that? Like if we become that team that wins every week or that's a Super Bowl contender every year, then it's different. But right now the focus needs to be on how do we get to that level? Exactly. And that's hopefully a path that Joe Shane can bring us to. I mean, he yeah. was a part of a team that, you know, established that with Josh yeah. Allen. Brian Dable was one of the coaches that developed it. So that's, that's the hope. That's the desire. Bowman also asks if this scenario played out and they let Daniel Jones go and they didn't like anybody in the 2023 class at quarterback. So they decided not to draft one. Would it make sense to trade their 2023 first round pick in a, uh, for a package that contains a 2024 first round pick. So then in the 2024 first round draft, they can do something similar to what the chiefs and the bills did and trade those two first round picks to move up and get a top tier 2024 first round quarterback. I like the idea in theory, but I think it also uh, comes down to what else is involved in that package. Are you getting day two picks in the 2023 draft? Are you getting day three picks in the 2023 draft? So I think uh, as a theory, it does make sense, but I think there are a lot of other variables that have to be considered. For sure. And I, and I agree with you. I agree with you, Nick. And I would say Bowman, that's an interesting concept and scenario. And I'm, I'm probably for it, to be honest, if I'm, if I'm going to, if depending on where they go, because I also think there's a scenario, this is probably one I'm leaning toward, by the way, as we stand today in week 15, and I talked about this on Twitter uh, I think yesterday or the day before. There's a scenario where they can re-sign Jones on a short-term deal and draft a quarterback. That's exactly what the Eagles did. They didn't re-sign him, but that's exactly what the Eagles did with Jalen Hurts. They drafted a developmental quarterback in round two. They had Carson Wentz already on the roster, only a few years removed from his MVP. They traded Wentz for premium assets, which is still insane, but even more insane that a year later, <laughs> the Colts were able to get back multiple draft picks from Washington for this loser, but um, they, that's even crazier, but they were able to do that with Wentz on the roster and with Wentz signed under contract. So that is still a scenario. They don't, if they resign DJ, it's not just throw your hands up. That's it. They still may like a quarterback in this draft class and believe that they can have both on their roster at once. One thing I've always argued about throughout time since I started doing this podcast is everyone has this like singular view on quarterbacks, right? Like there's one guy you get him. Don't you dare draft anyone over him. Competition is bad. Or no, they don't think that's too much pressure. You have to make it known that he's the guy. I think that's the dumbest thing ever. I I want to add as much quarterback talent to the quarterback room as possible. I want to take as many swings as possible. I ain't worried about these guys' feelings. I know that it's competition. If they're really the guy, they're not going to be bad if there's somebody else added behind them. They're going to actually play better if some competition is added behind them. So I am all for this idea if it does play out. And I'm never going to subscribe to, if you draft a guy, you can never draft anything interesting or add anything interesting around him because it's not, it gives the wrong impression. Fuck the, impression. The Eagles did. Language. The, the Eagles did resign Carson Wentz in 2019 okay. as well. Before yeah, they, they signed Hurts. 
And then they didn't like what happened during the 2019 season. And remember how we Roseman called the team a quarterback factory. And it was kind of like this joke, but the team <laughs> gravitated towards Jalen hurts. And you can see why the kid has a lot of leadership. The kid has a lot of character. Whereas Carson Wentz everywhere he's been, that hasn't necessarily been his MO. And he's so freaking slow processing Carson Wentz. You just, just sit back there. And as a sitting duck, it almost looks like, um, so let's see. Bruce K asks, how did the Giants find a way to win the final four games on the schedule? Wow, four and zero, Bruce. This is a it's a tough ask, um, but we'll try to answer. I'm curious of the strategy you guys would take to make these last set of games competitive. I think I would attempt to incorporate a little bit more quick game, which is something that we've been discussing. That can be out of twelve personnel. It can be at eleven personnel. I know we have an eleven personnel question coming up from our guy giant fan in Charlotte, but I think it has to still go down to you establishing the run and, and having success doing it. And I think it's just difficult because I don't think the giants have the personnel. I think they had a lot of success earlier in the year, working the play action, getting the running game going because the, the defensive coordinators weren't tracking exactly on how Mike Kafka was doing it. And they keep in a varied approach, but now it's on film and all of the little bells and whistles that they used, it's sniffed out at this point. So you need to kind of try to come up with another wrinkle to this offense. And we've saw it a little bit in overtime against Washington two weeks ago, the quick game, the slant flat, a couple of passes to Isaiah Hodgins that were a success. And then we also saw it a little bit against Philadelphia. Where we're like, look, they're moving the football, using a couple quick game passing attempts. Just get the football out of Daniel Jones's hands. But then that game just got blown open and we didn't necessarily see it. So I'm hoping that's the approach that we see against Washington. Just Put the ball in Daniel Jones's hands, allow him to go to work off of one quick read and hopefully get the football down the field. I think Nick nailed it. More quick game against Washington, a little bit more. I think they can stick to the mostly their game plan, just add a little bit more. Remember, they should have won that game two weeks ago against Washington. They were the better team that day. They played better. I don't say that about every game. I'm saying it about that game. But then you flip it forward, Minnesota game. That's a game where I will be. I will hope that Mike Kafka, and I don't care about the offensive line. I don't care about, oh my God, the receivers. I think Isaiah Hodgins is playing great on film. I think Darius Slayton is playing great on film. I don't care what anyone says. It's just there. I know everybody is, has their own opinions on this, and they just, no matter what, want to say they're the worst receivers in the world. But against Minnesota, Nick, I want them to come out, shotgun, 11 personnel a lot, 10 personnel sometimes, get receivers on the field. Even you could do it out of 12. I don't care. Want to do it out of 12? Fine, do it out of 12. But you need to be passing the ball early and often in that game. Not a lot of runs in that game. It needs to be shot, shot. No, pass the ball because Minnesota's pass defense right now is terrible. And they're just play, they play a weird style of coverage. I saw a stat today from a Minnesota guy who says their edges are dropping at a ridiculous rate into coverage. That's stupid. I saw a stat from uh, a breakdown from Nina Kimes where she was like, Minnesota, when they, Minnesota plays more off coverage than any team in the NFL on defense. And when those corners are in off coverage, they're like just destroyed. They're like EPA is bad. Everything is just like bottom of the league. So play the matchup there. You got to come out throwing. So Minnesota, that's what I want to do. I don't want to come out with our normal game plan. Let's see if we can grind this win out. No, no, no. Pass against a bad pass defense. Then we go to Indy. Indy is an interesting game. I think the Giants can pretty much just operate their normal game plan like Washington, and that's fine. And then Philly. Well, if Philly's playing their starters, there's not much I don't think the Giants can do. Unfortunately, yeah. But at that point, they very well might not be playing their starters, and they right, could be yeah. benching guys for a for an extended run. We also have a question right here from Giant Fan in Charlotte, as we brought up a little bit ago. Are the Giants running too much 11 personnel at a 66% clip, which ranks 15th in the NFL? Can 11 personnel succeed at such a rate without a star wide receiver one? I almost feel like 11 personnel could uh, or is, uh, has a much better chance to, like or sorry, I should say having a star wide receiver one actually helps you probably more out of like 12 and 13 personnel. I would think, I think the, for me, 11 personnel wouldn't work as much for the Giants. I'm curious to get your take on this, Nick, because they don't have the wide receiver two and the wide receiver three. If you had three Darius Slayton's on the field, I would be, I would want more 11 personnel. I would want that number, rate around 80%. Remember Sean McVay designed an offense. that was basically all 11 personnel it can work. Now you don't want that. You want to mix in other personnel groups at times, but what you really want to do in my mind is stress a defense vertically and horizontally at the same time. How do you do that? I think you do that by getting speed on the field. You don't really have that right now. Galladay is not fast. Hodgins is not particularly fast. Richie James, in my mind, is not particularly fast. Slayton is. You have one guy. So I think for me, the answer might be yes, but it's more so because I don't really think they have any other speed options outside of Slayton. 
I think they're also using 11 personnel when they're down. I think that's another big reason why. Because if you go back right. to the the winning streak, the four game winning streak that the Giants had from Chicago to Jacksonville, their 11 personnel rates starting in Chicago was 32.8 percent against Green Bay. It was 45.8 percent. Baltimore 51.6 percent, and then Jacksonville 61.4 percent. In the last several losses, if you want to go back to Seattle, 11 personnel, that was a 64.1 percent. That was a competitive game, even though it finished 27 to 13. Giants actually used a lot of 11 personnel against Houston, 73.1 percent. But then over the last two losses and the or last uh, three losses in the tie, it's been 86.1 percent against Detroit. 62.7% against Dallas. Washington was 49.2 and then Philadelphia was almost 90% because they were just blown out for most of that game. I think if the score is competitive, the Giants are going to use probably a little bit more 12 personnel. And I think we've seen that a lot throughout the season, but 11 personnel right now is what? Isaiah Hodgins, Darius Slayton, and Richie James when Richie James is healthy. Right. There is no true number one wide receiver to giant fan in Charlotte's point, but I think you can establish quick game at a solid rate out of 11 personnel because your 12 personnel package, it's not necessarily a dynamic blocking package, yeah. right? And they don't have receivers out of that either, other than Daniel Bellinger, who can block and receive. And then you're looking at Chris Myrick, Lawrence Cager, when he was up and players, yeah, and players like that, right? And like Nick Vanette, like what? Yeah. That, so it, I don't think the only issue on this team, Dan, is at the wide receiver position in terms of dynamic talent. So I don't necessarily have a huge problem with 11 personnel being used at that rate. I think there are other variables as to why it's being used at a 66% clip, which ranks only midway, you know, 15th in the league. And also uh, Giants fan in Charlotte ask as a follow up to this, is a star wide receiver one a requirement to generate the success that Brian Dable that got Brian Dable the head coach job. This is, of course, a Saquon Barkley question he asks. And I think the reason he's asking that, and to me it makes a lot of sense, is one, um, and we'll answer it if we agree, one, you know, there's been a lot of discussion of the big jump that Josh Allen and the Bills took when they traded for Stefan Diggs. Two, when he says this is, of course, a Saquon Barkley contract extension, if you give Saquon Barkley the 16, 17, 18 million against the cap, or even if it's 14, 15, 13, whatever it is, per year that he's going to ask for, then you probably are getting close to not having the cap space to trade for and re-sign a wide receiver one because the wide receiver contracts now are out of control. Christian Kirk, Zay Jones, looking at some of the, you know, A.J. Brown and Devontae Adams contract. A.J. Brown was actually kind of a deal, weirdly, but like the Devontae Adams re-signing, all of those types of things. And so if you add the – people don't think we have like this unlimited cap situation, but if the Giants re-sign Barkley and Jones, that's – that's basically it because they have to resign Thomas. They have to resign Dak. So you throw those four into it. That's your core. And now you're just relying on the draft basically from this point on as far as free agency goes and big contracts go. So I would ask you that question. One, do you think it's a requirement uh, for Dable? I don't know if it's a requirement, but it certainly helps, right? I mean, we saw that in Buffalo, but I right. think Brian Dable can have success with his scheme as well as just throwing one-on-one -on -one matchups. Like this offense isn't the Ben McAdoo offense where you're just relying on OBJ. But if you could tell me, hey, if Stefan Diggs is just going to join the Giants right now, is your offense going to be a lot better and more effective and more potent? Absolutely. Would you have more explosive plays? Of course. That's a better football player. But I don't necessarily know if it's a – die in the wall you need to have it or brian dable's a failure yeah i i don't and i don't yeah i i agree with that i think it's definitely a priority though because to me the best way that we're going to prove this offense now that we have a left tackle already in place a right tackle hopefully we'll see what happens there i still have faith there especially i just have faith that evan neal is going to be at worst like a solid contri a solid 10-year starter who's pretty damn good in pass pro eventually and probably never that great in run blocking but fine that's perfectly fine with me you have those two pieces quarterback we'll see i don't need a star running back personally on my roster i'd rather keep recycling these four-year rookie contracts for one million or less like damian pierce or khalil herbert and get two of them potentially um and so where am i spending my cap then i want it to be on a receiver i agree with Jaren Charlotte here, if that's what he's saying. I don't know if he's if he's saying that. And I think it will help Brian Dable. It will help the whole offense. It's one of the best ways they can improve this offense. So I don't know how they'll get one. It's either via the draft or it's probably not free. Like there's never, free, at this point, free agency wide receiver is really bad, right? Like I've, I've been we've reading. Seen, we've seen an uptick in, in the trades, right? The trading market yeah, has been a right. huge way to acquire. And I don't know if, 
I'm not sure if Joe Shane would, would want to do that. I mean, they did that in Buffalo with Stefan Diggs. We saw last off season, Tyree killed Devonte right. Adams, but now I'm like looking at my Cooper for a fifth round pick, such a steal, Insanity. such an absolute steal. I would love to get Amari Cooper for a fifth He's round. not even signed for that big of a contract. Either. He was like I, coming with a contract too. That was like signed years ago. So it's not even that bad. Yeah, that that would be a path that I'm not really 100% certain, Dan, on, on receivers that are coming to my mind who might be disgruntled or want out of a certain yeah. situation <laughs> that, that the Giants could try to leverage, but that could be a way. I think they're going to explore the draft. They did last year. They spent a second-round pick on a wide receiver. And, and a first-rounder the year before. And a first-rounder the year before and allocated a $72 million contract to a free right. agent. So it's not like they've overlooked the position. It's just it's been swing and a miss, swing and a miss, and a really devastating injury. Yeah, especially because he was coming on a lot at that point, Wandell. It's a really unfortunate. But EJ Hurd asks, how do you think DJ ceiling is impacted if he played with Tyler Taylor Heineke's confidence? Is it higher or lower by how much? I don't think it's unreasonable to say that Jones is a more talented quarterback, but sometimes it seems like Heineke has more trust in his abilities, though that sometimes gets him in trouble. I feel like it would drive DJ's turnover numbers up a little, but it would also make the offense much more explosive, which would be a welcome trade-off in my mind. What are your guys' thoughts? So my thought on this is, I don't think DJ is not a confident player, but I do think Taylor Heineke, there's something about his gunslinger mentality that would lead me to believe that he plays with a little bit more of a chip on his shoulder and a little bit more confidence. And I think it's something that you brought up about five or six weeks ago about how Daniel Jones doesn't really attack the 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 boundary too much, right? With the the flag and the corner routes and things of that yep. nature. So I brought up his heat map and, and you'll look at his heat map and it's like, nah, he has several throws over there to the sideline. But then you think about the Giants offense. A lot of the throws of the sideline are when? When he's rolling out, right? right? It's not when he's in the pocket. So I would love to see a heat map with Daniel Jones throws outside the numbers towards the sideline from the pocket. The That's pocket, something yeah. I would like to throw because how many times have you really seen him Make that whole shot, as you've said several times, not overly frequently, whereas I see Taylor Heineke do it. And then I'm just like, Daniel Jones has, in my opinion, much better arm talent than Taylor Heineke. And that leads me back to EJ's question where I'm like, man, EJ might be onto something here. If Daniel Jones just trusts his ability to hit those hole shots, maybe a bit more, we would see an uptick in explosive plays because the Giants offense is predicated on getting him on the run, right? And that's when he's throwing outside the numbers and also attacking the middle of the field. But you don't see too many shots that are horizontal from the same side of the field, hole shots on those corner and seven routes. So we're not talking about coming from the backside and running across the entire field. We're talking about I'm aligned in a reduced set by the tight end, by the tackle. I release eight, 10 yards up, and then I stem to the outside and I go towards the sidelines and I get hit over my shoulder. Like we saw Jalen Hurts do several times against the Giants. We haven't seen that too much with Daniel Jones. So I think EJ could be onto something here. Yeah. I mean, look, EJ, I would do that trade off any day as well. I would take more turnovers or more, more interceptions if I could get some whole shots in there. Um, so from my perspective, this is these are the two things that scare me most about Daniel Jones moving forward. As far as me predicting, if he could be the Giants future, if they resign him, if he could ever get to an elite level, if they add talent are one, I don't see nearly enough of these whole shots. And I don't see nearly enough throws from inside the pocket, outside the numbers as Nick just broke down. These, to me, are the throws that define quarterbacks. It's the reason I was never high on Robert Griffin. It's the reason I was super high on Trevor Lawrence. And when I watched Trevor Lawrence's film this week for a CBS Sports podcast against the Titans, that was filthy quarterback film. And what did he do? He threw with anticipation before receivers got out of breaks, and he continued over and over and over again. He did this against Baltimore in their comeback, too, to challenge those types of throws outside the numbers, in between the safety. There was a whole shot he threw to Evan Ingram, where I swear to God, Nick, I put it on Twitter. There was a linebacker and a safety, and Ingram ran the route basically just right up the seam, and he had a step in between those dudes. So there was five yards. I counted it on my screen. Five yards between the linebacker and the safety, and then Ingram ran over that. So it, Lawrence literally ripped it in between a four-yard window there, and that's it's that it's one thing it's the whole shots outside the numbers Nick talked about the other thing I need to see more of from DJ I guess I don't we're running out of time but I need to see more of those types of throws outside the numbers in the red zone right and in targeted and into the end zone past the goal line right to the side past the goal line that's what I'm looking for because he doesn't even attempt those throws and we haven't been successful completing any of those throws really we had one to Hodgins two weeks ago that was really just a filthy route by Hodgins and a really easy throw 
I, I don't really know if we've had, we had one to slate. And I think at one point this year, if I remember the Jacksonville throw, but that was also kind of just like a, he beat him from 25 yards out, throw it when it gets condensed in the red zone. We're not seeing enough of those touchdown throws that land in the end zone. That's a real problem to me that combined with those outside throws. Those are the two things that define quarterbacks for me. Can you consistently challenge outside the numbers? Because defenses, it's easy to take away the middle of the field. It's much harder to take away the outside and in the red zone condensed, the same thing it's true, but it's even more pronun uh, pronunciated. Like you have less, you have nothing to work with in the middle of the field. Really. You have to kind of hit those outside the numbers throws. And so we'll see what happens with that. I don't know if it's a confidence thing to me. I feel like Nick, and this is something I think I, I got a credit. I think I was um, David Cy Syverstein of big blue and We've had him on the show once or twice, I think. And we're going to have him. On again. Yeah. Syverson, I forgot. Yeah. Syverson, my bad. <laughs> my bad. Uh, you know, I'm horrible with me. I do this all the time. But he said when he did his original evaluation from Jones, the two things that he said, and I believe he said the second thing. I know he said the first thing. He has incredibly slow eyes. And that's something I saw as well at Duke. And I know you saw this as well. But I think it was him or someone else. might have been Schofield. Someone said he's just a very robotic quarterback. And I kind of completely agree with that. He's a very robotic quarterback. So I don't know if it's a confidence issue or if it's just kind of like, I'm Daniel Jones. I catch the ball. The coaches say, look here. If it's not there, run. And that's just kind of it type of thing. I just feel like the, his whole career with Giants, same thing with Garrett. Garrett says, do this, don't do this, do this. You know, all the coaches he's had, even Shermer. Shermer says, half field, high, read high to low. I do this every play. I read high to low. And it's not, there's not much um, kind of creativity, I almost feel like. It's a very robotic way to play quarterback. And so I don't know if it's a confidence issue or this is just kind of what he is as a quarterback. I think one rebuttal to that that somebody yeah. could say that's plausible would be it's because he hasn't had the ability to be in one system at one time. For like, sure. I don't think I don't I think that goes more to the robotic point rather than the point of challenging the whole shots because the whole shot point is something like you need to be able to consistently threaten the defense at every level of the field. Jones has the arm talent to do that. I've said that right. since he was drafted, but I don't think we consistently see him do that on those flag routes. And then you have a high safety, you have a low flat defender. There is a hole that you can throw the football into. Daniel Jones has the touch to make those passes. He has the arm strength to make those passes, but sometimes he doesn't consistently make those passes and he settles on the little check down type routes. And those types of decisions are the decisions that frustrate me sometimes about Daniel Jones. But I think when we say confidence, I don't want people to think that we believe like, oh, Daniel Jones is just an unconfident quarterback. No, it's just Taylor Heineke has that gunslinger mentality. And as you said, Dan, gets him in trouble a lot. Daniel Jones since the Jason Garrett system got implemented, he's been a much more conservative type of quarterback. And that's all well and good. No one wants to turn the football over. But I do think there is an argument where it's like, do you really want to be that conservative in an NFL where explosive plays are as paramount as they actually are? And it's a fair argument, especially when you realize like the way to differentiate, the only way to really gain consistency as a quarterback in this league is to, like you just said, threaten all levels of the field. That means outside the numbers. That means down the field that means in the condensed red zone and one thing i always think about with him it almost feels like he's not going to make those throws unless it really looks perfect right like unless that safety has a ton of distance between the second and third guy but like i said when i watched lawrence this week man he was just throwing balls that were just not like if you looked at it on tape you'd be like why are you attempting that dude the safety is like within a yard or two of where you're of the in between like there's no hole there and he's just like f it i think this is a hole i trust my arm talent and like you said, Nick, GJ has good arm talent. I honestly think it's better than I originally thought coming out of Duke. And I think it's weirdly like improved this year. I don't know how to explain it, but I think the ball is coming out way better this year than it ever has with Daniel Jones, especially in these cold weather games. Like um, the, the past two they've played, like I just feel like I've seen a different level of arm talent from him than in the past. And I don't know what to attribute that to. It could just be off-season regimen, working on your legs and your core, things of that nature. We've seen Dak Prescott really improve his arm talent and arm strength as he's gone through the NFL. So it's not an issue of talent from the arm. He has that ability, right? You see yeah. it, with, and this is a great example with Heineke. Heineke has no arm, and he still challenges those throws and those areas of the field. So I don't know what it's going to take, but we, we do need that. And Daniel Jones is so much better throwing over the middle of the field than Taylor So much Heineke. better. So much better. And better so throwing over the top. I think he's better at all levels, really. Yeah, no, I would agree. And I was laughing a little bit before, Dan, because, bro, you have so many Italian mannerisms. You were doing this. You were doing this. You were doing this. I told you, I want awesome. to be Italian. And I grew up with a lot of Italian friends. So I absolutely love it. So we have a really interesting question from El Jefe, our friend. He asks, who would win a rap battle, Nick 
or Dan? And I have to ask you, because I know you're somewhat more of a rap enthusiast than I am. Can you rap at all? I've never tried it. My good friend, Ben Brosh, shout out Ben Brosh, was trying it at one point and like uh, did did a couple battle raps or like tried to write some stuff with our boy, uh, Eric Neveloff, our old friend. They called themselves Cousin Skeet and Binya Binya. I think it was, or Cousin Skeet wow. and something. Yeah, it was like a throwback. Um, I've never tried it. I would say, I would assume that you're going to be better, Nick, because a lot of listeners don't know this. Some who have been here forever might know this because I've hinted at it before, but Nick, uh, was a rapper in the past and has like some <laughs> raps that he wrote and recorded that are like lost yeah. in like one of his old computers or phones that I've been trying to personally uncover for a very long time. I may have to go talk to Diana. So I need to find a way to get my hands on these things and really let them just rip on my speakers, on my Bluetooth. I would love to hear your raps. I think you even told me they were like NFC East rap. They were like NFL type raps. Were like, yeah, was- I wrote a, I wrote a rap for the 2016 NFL draft. And then the 2016 <laughs> NFL uh, like preseason, like just before the preseason, That's like all the storylines that were going on. And I used to be <laughs> able to, I used to be able to do like the really difficult part of Rap God, that uh, Eminem song. Okay. That, that yeah, part, like yeah. I, I used to be able to nail that. And I, I think I videotaped it and put it somewhere. I would have to find it though. <laughs> so I used to have like really, I'm, I might still, if I practice, like really good voice control and things okay. of that nature, but I, I, I haven't tried it in years now. That's great. So we're going to give Nick that one for sure, El Jefe. Keep it, keep it coming, Al Jefe. Though keep your videos coming because they give me a little bit of a laugh on these dark weeks that we've had with the Giants lately. Unfortunately, David Goodman asks, with the state of the roster, wouldn't it make more sense to start over at quarterback and running back than t- than it would to tie up around forty million per year against the cap at these positions going forward? Yeah, I think so. Right. I mean, I think it's a, a conversation. It depends on what you. Depends on which direction you want to go in, but in terms of Saquon Barkley, because you got to look at both of these guys individually. And Saquon Barkley has had a pretty injury plagued career. Started off this season incredibly hot, now slowing down again. What's happening? Giants are sucking. Giants are losing. And now you have to really have this conversation with what a 26 year old running back. Do you want to allocate you know the highest paid contract to the running back position to him? And I don't think that's the most prudent way to build a roster personally. So. Starting over is uh, is going to be difficult with the Daniel Jones thing that we already kind of talked about. But if you're going to kind of package both of these guys together, as you said a little bit earlier in the podcast, you're allocating a lot of your cap to those two guys. And then you're going to have to re-sign all the guys who are on your roster, which is going to give you virtually little flexibility to go out in free agency and do what you may want to do to improve this roster and the image that you want to build it in. So I think it's uh, right now I'm in a 50-50 type of, um, I think, situation where I'm not really hundred percent certain which way I want the giants to lean. I am kind of taking it game by game, but I, I don't think it's unreasonable at least to speculate that the most prudent course of action would be to restart. Yeah, it depends. I think the answer, David, is it depends what you view as a general manager or as a fan to be there, like to be the ceiling of re-signing a, a Barkley and a Jones. Do you think the ceiling is, and I know a lot of fans do, that if they get both on the roster, they can draft well enough. Like Nick just said, there is no real free agency. That's that's throw it out because once you sign Andrew Thomas, Jones, Barkley, and Dexter Lawrence, plus potentially Julian Love, Xavier have, McKinney, Xavier McKinney, you have no cap. That's it. You're not, you're not probably going to be able to afford all. You have to start dumping cap to future years, which they would do if they started winning consistently. That's what all the teams do, and they should. The Eagles have a ton of dead cap coming because they just push it back. Um, but I'm uh, using my hands again. But if you so anyway, so if you view that as a chance for them to make a Super Bowl run with those guys, then you then you then it makes sense to resign them for sure. If you see a ceiling, if you don't then that becomes a different question. Now, when it comes from where I'm at with regards to both of them, I'm sure we'll get other questions. So we can just skip those if we, if we answer them now, but I am definitely more in the camp of leaning toward resigning Jones and not resigning Barkley. Why would I say that? Well, for Jones, I do still think there is upside there. And I know that I'm not as sold as other people that if you just get him receivers and O line, he's going to look phenomenal out there. That I don't think is a guarantee. That we have no evidence suggests that's a guarantee, but I think it's possible. I really do believe that. And a lot of it has to do with 
the strides he's made as a uh, from pocket presence standpoint this year, the strides he's made throwing the ball off platform. And I think that goes back to what I was talking about. Maybe some off season regimen, some workout that's improved his arm talent because I'm seeing better arm talent than I ever have. He struggled. Remember the last couple of years with Garrett, dude, when they tried to roll him out, he would like short arm balls. They would bounce. They would be way off target. That's not happening anymore. His ability to throw on the run specifically to his right has really improved. I think overall, He's done better in a lot of ways as, and he still has the arm talent to believe in. So he, and he's tall. I like that about him. I do. I think you got to be tall to be, I know I really do. I think I that's agree. part of the issue with Kyler and Russell and those types. Um, but so I still think there is potential upside there with Barkley. For me, I'm completely out on re-signing him. Now I think the giants will re-sign him and I'm going to be fine with that. It's okay. But I would not re-sign Saquon Barkley at this point. I I think it has to be at like a Nick Chubb, Dalvin Cook level deal, which is like twelve million a year. And, and I don't I know. If they think, want- I think that if the Giants were in a different state of their roster, I would be okay with that kind of contract. But based on what David is saying with the current state of the roster, which I think David is personally saying, and I agree with him, they're not that close to a Super Bowl. They went seven and one. It was fun. They beat a couple decent teams, Titans and Ravens. But now we're kind of seeing what the roster, what the roster is really like with a few injuries. And everyone can say, oh, we're so unlucky with injuries. But then you can look at all these other examples of like massively injured teams like the 49ers and stuff that just continue to roll on and trudge forward. The Cowboys lost their franchise quarterback for half the season. They're trudging forward, right? And so we're not really that close. And so given where we're at, that's why I'm fully out on re-signing Barkley. I am almost like, I, I don't want to do it, but I'm almost positive they are going to re-sign Barkley. I just know the Giants. So I'm going to be fine with that. Don't worry. I'm not going to be sitting here like, I know best. I'm the man. What I say is right. We can't do this. But I don't see the value of it with where our current roster is at. I would personally love to restart the rookie contract scale at running back, take one of these Damien Pierce or Khalil Herbert types, have them under contract for four years at $1 million, or I think it's like 800 k against the cap save that 14 million in cap space on Barkley, potentially get a younger, fresher back, not resign him, use that 14 million to upgrade wide receiver, corner, linebacker, or offensive line. Yeah, I think I'm right there with you. And I'm also in the camp of, I think, entertaining, resigning Jones to, like I said, a more franchise prudent type of deal as we've laid out this entire pod. And David also asked, are the right type of players being used on play calls versus various matchups, specific route combos, screens, blitz packages? Because, and he said this, Garrett used to drive us crazy with things of this nature. So essentially he's asking, are the Giants putting their players into the best positions to succeed? That's a great question. I have to really think about that. I think one thing I would like them to do more that I don't see them do is they use these tight ends to chip and release all the time. I'd love to see them run a tight end screen. They haven't run that in a while. I don't know if they've run it at all this year. They probably run it once or twice earlier. And if I can remember, but there's guys are chipping and releasing all the time, run a tight end screen here, right? Like throw, throw it off guard or even just a middle screen to Barkley. They never run a middle screen either. It's like always, you know, actually they did run it against Dallas and that was the play where they didn't didn't block it. Well, but, (laughs) <laughs> yeah, so I guess they did try to run it, and they're like, "Ah, oh, shit! Look what happens when we have that was Jack Anderson and Mark Lewinsky. Lewinsky's still a starter, but Anderson is not obviously going to play. Hopefully, any more snaps this year. But, um, but yeah, I think as far as the rest of it goes, I can't really think of anything specifically where I'm like, these guys should be running this route, and they're not running it. What about you, Nick? Well, no, I think the Giants are a very injured team right now. When you're talking about scheme on defense, their secondary is beat up. You're talking about route combinations at wide receiver. A lot of their wide receivers are hurt or dusted at this point. I mean, Wando Robinson, we knew he was going to be such a key and crucial part of this offense. He's down for the count. So I don't necessarily look at the wide receivers and think they're being misused. I think they're just working with the most talented guys they have. And that says a lot because a lot of those guys weren't even here recently. And Kenny Galladay is getting paid $72 million playing 11 snaps for you, but he can't create separation. He can't really do all that much at this moment. So how are you going to utilize that skill set with all that money? It's difficult. And in terms of Wink Martindale, I think Wink Martindale has to run a lot of man coverage right now. And it's what he wants to do, but I think he wants to, I think he's running more man coverage than he probably wants to do because a lot of those guys, as you've said, they weren't even here in training camp. They weren't here during install man coverage is so much more of a simpler type of coverage concept than, you know, cover three match or something like that. Right. So I think the giants are kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place in terms of their personnel, which might hinder them from using their personnel in a manner that they would optimally like to. Yep. I completely agree with that. And I would say 
One thing, just additional, I'd like to see a little bit more of maybe a couple, you know, run Daniel Bellinger vertical up the seam, take a shot. But that requires what we were talking about for Jones to take those chances, which we haven't really seen much of as far as the seam ball. I don't, we've seen a single vertical seam throw this year. I can't even think of one. Really. Not many. A lot of teams. I mean, vertical seams are great against middle of the field open yeah. type of defenses. Giants, don't, they don't, Giants don't see too much middle of the field True. open. The Eagles ran a decent amount of middle of the field open against them, especially when it's cover two and not cover four, or four match or whatever. Right. The only one, one final thing on the Barkley thing before we move on past that. I would say this. I was watching clips of Josh Azudu today because I was just talking about in my, I was just, I wrote a tweet about it and I was thinking in my head, like how I think he's been a much bigger loss than people realize, especially with how he was coming on. And there was one clip where he made a great block to open up a hole for Barkley against Jacksonville. And it just really doesn't look like the player I saw run, run that play, Saquon Barkley on that is not the player that he's been the last four games. I think he's playing through an injury. I don't think he's fresh. And if we resign him, what are the chances that we ever get a full fresh season out of him? And those chances go down every single year in the contract, right? I mean, you know, the average shelf life for running backs now is under 27. That's it. And we're signing him at the tip of that. We're starting with the start. We would be resigning him at the start of that. So it's an insanely risky play to resign him. I still think they're going to do it again. Not what I would do, but I think it's what they're going to do. So it is what it is. Just some dude asked. Here's a list of the Eagles 2023 free agents. Surely Roseman can't bring all these guys back, right? Any interest in the Giants signing any of these guys? So they've got a lot of free agents, and he's right that their cap situation is not good right now. Now, I'll believe it when I see it as far as the Eagles being in cap hell. I think they'll just continue to do these magic tricks they do with the cap, mostly which are like, you know, the void years and just pushing cap back. I don't know it fully what comes into it. I'm not a cap expert. Um, even though I once made that claim that people will never live down, let me live down, uh, as a trying to make an exaggeration, exaggerated point about the cap, but Fletcher Cox, Robert Quinn, Brandon Graham, Javon Hargrave, that's four defensive linemen that play a lot of snaps for them. Maybe not Quinn. I don't know if he plays a lot. Kelsey, Jason Kelsey, the best center in the NFL, probably still James Bradbury, Isaac Sumalu, Andre Dillard, Kaiser White, TJ Edwards. And then Sue, Joseph, Boston, Scott, Miles Sanders, and then Chauncey Gardner-Johnson, too. Wow, that's a lot of free agents. It is. It's quite a bit. Now, I'm looking at some of those names. A lot of those guys are still talented, but they're at the latter years of their career. They've already been paid a lot of money. I think a lot of those guys are going to be trying to go for a Super Bowl if Philly does not win one this year, and they might be willing to come back on a team-friendly type of deal. And the guys who fall into that are Fletcher Cox, Brandon Graham, possibly Robert Quinn, who I believe is on the IR right now, maybe even a James Bradbury. We'll have to wait and see with that one. And Jason Kelsey, who they already drafted his replacement, but if he can still play, which we just watched his film, he definitely can still play. I don't know if he would leave Philadelphia. He is right. Philadelphia, right? So I think a lot of those top dogs, they might be retained for a cheaper contract than they would get at other places. But to your point, just another dude. I think it is right. We interact yeah. with him quite a bit. Just some dude, not another. I think they're going to lose out on some of these guys like the Andre Dillards and the players who were drafted there, but they didn't necessarily have the biggest impact. Even like a Miles Sanders. I don't think Howie Roseman's going to no. probably resign Miles Sanders unless no it's a shot. very team friendly type deal. So I still think they're going to be a powerhouse, despite the fact that they have all of these free agents. A lot of them are a little bit older than, um, then a lot of them are just older, to be honest. Right. Like a lot, like Lindell Joseph and Adama Kansu have been there for five minutes, but they signed there on cheap contracts to revitalize their career and to also chase a ring. I'm smiling because I see two free agents that would interest me. Austin I Scott. Get, <laughs> no, I think they get on cheap deals. TJ Edwards, the linebacker we talked about a lot on the Giants Offensive Film Podcast. I know he's from Wisconsin. It may sound a little biased, but he's been phenomenal. I think he'd be an immediate upgrade over whatever the hell the Giants have at linebacker. And I don't think he costs that much either you can get him on a pretty reasonable deal or kaiser white who i think would add some athleticism to the giants linebacker core so i would be interested in both of those two players same here yeah i would love to get both of those guys in the building and giants could have a realistic shot at at either one which one would you prefer <laughs> what do you think of course that's why i asked you <laughs> <laughs> dougie analytics asked do you have any critiques on the coaching staff utilization of the available personnel we kind of asked that already he also asks what what's red and smells like blue paint <laughs> I went right over my head. Oh, it's red paint, dude. Blue paint smells the same. Okay. 
All right, all right, Dougie Analytics. Um, yeah, yeah, we answered the critiques of the coaching staff the utilization of personnel already, I think. So one thing I would say is I would like to see a little bit more Brita and and Brightwell, probably in a little more 21 personnel to get those. I think that's a fair one. I think yeah. the 21 personnel, I think you have to change things up maybe a little bit or at least have a package to change things up. And I'm also wondering why the Giants have deviated so much from the Wildcat, which they had success True. with earlier in the season. So that's another... I don't know if critique is the right word word because I think some of it might just come down to Saquon Barkley not being as fresh as he once was. But I think even having that package in your arsenal and going to it in third and short, second and short type situations can at least make the defense plan for something different and alter their game plan, maybe just a little bit, just to threaten them because the Giants need to do something offensively to change and spice things up. And earlier in the season, they had that with the Wildcat, but now it, we haven't seen it in several games. Yep. Okay, Keith Levin asks, Dan, how's your journey going through the great uh, journey through the Grateful Dead going? What's been your favorite era? Great question, Keith. Uh, I've been really, really enjoying this journey with the Grateful Dead. I, I, I mentioned maybe a year ago and maybe less that I had never really listened to the Grateful Dead. I started pounding Grateful Dead content, and it is freaking phenomenal stuff. It's not going to ever top my favorite band of all time, Allman Brothers. Different kind of rock to me. It's not as fast. It's not as guitar heavy. I, the guitar is not as good. Nothing. I don't think any guitar is as good as Allman Brother guitar. I'm going to be quite clear. Dwayne Allman and Dickie Betts, you're just not going to beat that combination, especially live at the Fillmore East album. That's just as good as it gets from a guitar standpoint and i like their more bluesy feel but grateful dead does have some bluesy tongs that i really like and i'm just gonna say my favorite errors probably like 69 through 73 for the grateful dead i really like europe 72 that's a great uh, there's a bunch of great stuff like albums i've heard i guess it's all spotify based but there's a ton of different europe 72s that i listen to um there's a Cornell. there's a, the cornell one i think it's cornell 77 that's later but that's amazing too uh, they're just phenomenal band. Like I just have so much fun listening to them. They're so enjoyable. They do things so well. I don't know. It's great. T Touch of Grey, amazing song. Like fourteen year old me, we we would ball out to Touch of Grey. Nice. Oh yeah. All right. Young Missile asks, "What would you guys do to address the inside linebacker core if you were Joe Shane in the offseason?" He and he wrote it as core, C O R E. So. Just gonna say right. that's how he's, I. To, he's wrong. I mean, well, he's wrong, but I understand where he's coming from, and. He says, I know drafting for need isn't ideal, but that position just can't be ignored anymore. I would agree. Yeah. And I haven't done enough study on yeah. the linebacker position, but I'm not opposed to going in and draft. And if the value aligns where the Giants are selecting, making that pick. But I'm also not opposed to doing what you just suggested with the Kaiser White, with the TJ Edwards, and whoever else is on the free agent wire. Somebody who is familiar, maybe even with Wink Martindale's defense, who can come in here and just solidify this position. Also, just someone who's instinctive and knows how to read blots and knows how to scrape over the top and get in position to keep their chest clean. Just like simple linebacking things, because I just yeah. felt like the Giants haven't necessarily had that. You get it in spurts with Jalen Smith every now and again, but ideally you don't want Jalen Smith starting for your defense. It's definitely an upgrade over Tay Crowder, in my opinion. Micah McFarland. Bad, and I feel like he might have some athletic limitations as you, as you have pointed out in the past, but I am all for going for veteran free agents or the draft. I just think you have to upgrade this position. Completely agree. We'll, we'll look more into it. Young missile. When we get to the off season, as far as free agents go, we named a couple. I'd be interested in TJ Edwards. Good words. Cause you're, it's only from one roster uh, draft will be interesting too. Greg Cole asks, let's try a survivor question. Dan, who's your favorite player? Nice, nice, nice way to just kind of just skim over his last name. Uh, Kaola? <laughs> no, like I always feel like every time Greg asks us a question, you either try to have me read it or you just like just like say it really fast. Yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> I don't know how to pronounce these names. If you've been able to keep up with despite the giant film, what are your thoughts on the new era survivor? So great question. I'm going to be watching the finale tonight. We're recording this a couple hours before it or an hour before it. Um, so my favorite player from the very start was Jesse. And Jesse just pulled, I don't want to, it's fine. I'm spoiling it. It's a week to week show. You should be watching it. There should be nobody like four episodes behind on Survivor. Like, sorry if you are. Fast forward if you're not caught up with Survivor. But my favorite character is Jesse. I loved him from the start. I loved his backstory. Jumped into a gang as a kid. Went to juvie. Came out. Now is like, I was like, re, re, uh, re, formed rebirth person with a wife and kids. And he's just trying to like make some money, like make, you know, help them out and change their lives. And, He's been my favorite from the start because of his story, but then the play he made last week was arguably one of the greatest plays in Survivor history. I'm not going to go over it because I don't want to spoil it in case you haven't heard it, but that's a little bit of a spoiler, but it was one of the best plays I've ever seen. I think he's playing a phenomenal game. I hope he wins tonight. It's going to be hard, though, because this made him a massive target. Uh, as far as the new era Survivor goes, I don't love it. I like the old era a little bit better, 
And I just think they're putting too many twists into the game. Let them play the game the way it's supposed to be played. I don't need all these twists, like the hourglass twist. Thank God they got rid of it this season. But two seasons, they dumped the hourglass twist. And actually, former, this will appeal to you a little bit, Nick, former NFL player. Do you remember Danny McRae? Cowboys. Uh, I remember the name, but I don't yeah. really know much about it. He was him. on Survivor two years ago. And okay. one of the, one of the twists was they split into teams of five, and it's a challenge. And if the the five who won were supposed to be immune from getting voted out, and the five who lost were going to go to tribal council and be voted out, then they put in this dumbass twist called the hourglass twist, where someone could turn an hourglass over from the losing team, or no, there was like an extra player that didn't play, and now the team that won are now losers, and the team that lost the challenge is now winners, and th they're now immune, the losers. The winners have to go to tribal, and McCray went freaking off on Jeff Probst, the host. He was just ripping into him. He's like, I've been a comp an athlete my whole life. I've been competing my whole life. This is the most ridiculous thing. All the Survivor fans agreed. One of the worst ideas ever for a twist, and they removed it at least, but the fact that they had it for two seasons is horrible, and so there's some issues with it that I have, Greg, but we won't talk too much more Survivor. It's the Giants podcast. Survivor is one show that I have obviously never seen. And Dan, yeah. did that surprise you at all? <laughs> it's the only reality show I've ever seen, really. I've probably watched, like, I've watched Jersey Shore from time to time, but it's the only reality show I ever got into, I should say, because I've never seen the Jersey game... Shore either. Oh, I've definitely seen some Jersey Shore. Yeah, I've never seen uh, that either. <laughs> the gameplay on Survivor is very similar to poker, which is why I love it a lot. Um, mm, oh, okay. Yep. So we, we have a question from the Joker, Arthur Fleck. He asks, do you feel that the bust rate in NFL drafts is shrinking due to better scouting processes and analytics? Also, much does it matter? Does it matter much that an offensive line coach is top notch or just decent? Two great questions. I'm not sure I have great answers for you, Arthur. As far as the bust rates go, I haven't studied bust rates. So I don't know if that's true. What you're saying that it's that it's shrunk. Um, as far as analytics and scouting goes, so I don't know how to answer that one with any kind of definitiveness. I will say, as far as the second question goes, I used to think like there's like two or three unreal offensive line coaches and they make all the difference. But then the Patriots are such a weird example because they lost Dante Scarnecchia when he retired. And now there's still that same dominant line and they like lose Shaq Mason. doesn't matter. They like trade away all their guys. It doesn't matter. They're still just like this dominant team that no matter who the hell you put back there at running back, they're running the ball successfully. Um, I think in fantasy, they've been a top five rushing offense for like seven years or something ridiculous like that. So I don't know what it is. So I would say that I'm not so sure as I used to be on the O-line coach question. What are your thoughts on both these questions? Yeah, I'm right there with you in terms of studying bus rate. I haven't, I don't want to have any information on that. But offensive line, if you could tell me you're going to have Jeff Statlin, Dante Scarnecchia, yeah. or or Bill Callahan or something like that, I'm going to be all about that. Mike Munchick, <laughs> you could just throw Howard sure. Mudd when he was alive, rest in peace. Like those guys, I feel like were powerhouse offensive linemen who were wildly revered. So I would rather have them than some of your run of the mill type of offensive line coaches. In terms of Bobby Johnson, just because I know. There's a question in here about Bobby Johnson. I'm not certain if we will get to him. I still remain high on Bobby Johnson. I like what he says. I don't think he has the best personnel to work with, right. but he's not in that upper echelon. He hasn't necessarily proven that so far. And this offensive line remains an issue, even though the Giants did add new bodies to it. But I'm not out on him just because I know there is a question somewhere in this script on Bobby Johnson. Okay. Michael Benoit asks, mock draft of our can you mock draft our first four rounds by just position? What rookie player has missed or that he has three questions. Um, so it's the first one mock draft first four rounds by position. We don't, I'll just answer this first. Uh, Nick and I don't subscribe to that. We don't draft for position. We draft for players. So we'll, we'll say that over and over. We get these questions a lot. We're not a, we don't believe in the, you got to draft this position, this round, this position, that round. As far as your next question, which rookie player has missed the most or all the season that could surprise next season. If healthy, that's an interesting one. It's definitely an interesting one. And I'm not going to say Wandell. I think I'm going to go with Darian Beavers. Darian Beavers, there was a lot of hype around Darian Beavers, and then he tears his ACL in the preseason game against Cincinnati, and everyone kind of forgets about him. But there's no doubt in my mind, Dan, that if Darian Beavers was healthy right now, he would be playing. Like they, oh, they're yeah. putting, they're begrudgingly putting Tay Crowder out there right now just to spell the other two linebackers. And I don't think they even really want to play Micah McFadden maybe as much as they are. Darian Beavers would have a huge role on that defense. Unfortunately, he's hurt, so he would be my guy. Yeah, I think you're right about that. Beavers is the obvious choice here. He also finishes by saying, uh, who's your favorite Looney Tunes character growing up and has it changed? I never, fun fact, I've never watched, really watched the Looney Tunes. I think that was like before both of our era. It was, I caught yeah. some of it though. And I guess Daffy Duck, just because I remember like Adam Sandler and Jimmy Fallon, like 
kind of like mocking them in like a funny voice. And I uh, thought it was hilarious. I thought Bugs Bunny was kind of pretentious, you know, he's just screwing with that old <laughs> geriatric Elmer Fudd, you know, I was always messed up in my opinion. So maybe Daffy. Okay. I like it. Um, Chris Berlin asks, or sorry, Matt Dubois asks. Nice. Dubois. Yeah. You like that? I did Benoit and Dubois. We've had two uh, French Canadians of the answer. Ask the last two questions. Matt Dubois asks, if you go back in time and remake one personnel decision that Joe Shane made in his first off season, whether it be free agency or the draft, what, what decision would you remake? This is a great question. This is an amazing question. And it really makes me want to dive into the draft. Cause there are like, I want to like, I may, might want to pull up the draft because free agency, I think the easy answer would be the Mark Lewinsky deal. Yes. Maybe. And Mark Lewinsky, look, he he's not been playing well recently. But then again, you look at the draft and you're like, did the Giants kind of miss a player here or there during the draft? Like you can look at the Wandell Robinson pick as much as I like Wandell Robinson. There were some guys who were drafted after Wandell that I think you can at least make an argument would be more dynamic. It's just do they fit into the culture of the New York Giants, i.e. a George Pickens. I think Joe Shane might not have went in that direction for for the said quote unquote character issues. But it's a fun conversation to have. What about you? Yeah, I think there's a few decisions I would consider. The first would be trading out the money you spent on Glowinski, trying to get like a James. Dan but the problem with th that decision is all the guys I want more cost more, and they didn't have any cap. They barely have any cap space at all. The only reason they had even functioning right now is because they had to once again push back and restructure Leonard Williams some more, which is leading to this crazy third. He didn't want to do anything. Shane wanted to do that. Hell no, he didn't. And Adoree. So we didn't really have any money, so I'm not going to go with the free agent route. But I already have I already have the easy one. I just looked up the draft. Oh yeah. The hindsight one. What is it? Uh bro, it's a bad one though, too. And it's something that we were saying. Like you you gamble on players like this. Tariq Wollen, he was taken in the fifth freaking oh, yeah, round. Yeah. After Mike like yeah. <laughs> after we Micah McFadden. We talked about him a lot in the pre-draft. And DJ Davidson. DJ Davidson was drafted before him. Like Ooh. to me, that's like a 25-year-old defensive tackle who was like fine but like Tariq Wollen had so many traits like the guy ran like a 428 or something insane with the I would never line. take a DJ Davidson at 25 years old over a Tariq Wollen like just for the mere fact of like these guys are most likely not going to make it we might as well bet on the traits exactly wow. and I get he's coming out of UT UTSA but he's a 23 year old six foot four 210 pound cornerback who is now what has six career interceptions ran a four two six in the 40 with just yeah. insane insane numbers 42 inch vert 10 11 broad so like i just don't know why the nfl misses on guys like this consistently i don't know either that's the best one so that's the right answer for me it would either be george pickens over wando i'm not too worried about the quote unquote character concerns. I completely agree with what Mike Tomlin said right after that. He's like, I want guys who are going to demand the ball and want the ball. That's how it should be. Um, so I'm personally fine with that. And let's get to like a shocky level where he was like legit yelling at Eli in the huddle and like coming back and doing that type of stuff. Pickens didn't do any of that. He just asked for the ball and want the ball more after the game. That's, that's fine with me. But one that's interesting would be, and this is something that you kind of can look back and consider is like, would the Giants be better long term with a Garrett Wilson over an Evan Neal? That's the question. I would mm -hmm. still take Evan Neal over Garrett Wilson because I just am so obsessed with improving the offensive line before the receivers. But if Neal just ends up being this solid, decent player at right tackle and Wilson ends up being a star receiver, then the best decision was to take Wilson because it's not just about getting the position right. It's about getting the player right and getting the prospect right and trying to maximize that pit, that asset. So that one's interesting to me. I think it is interesting, and I'm right in the same camp as you. You go for the offensive lineman, but Garrett Wilson looks like the real deal. We like Garrett Wilson. And Neil, quite frankly, hasn't. Yeah. No, no. And I think there's a much more difficult transition for oh. tackles coming into the NFL than there are wide receivers. So that that has to be factored in. But in two years, if we're saying like, yo, man, I wish we drafted Garrett Wilson instead of Evan Neal. I don't think it would necessarily shock me, although I still remain high on Neil and I hope he does develop. I trust the kid's conscientiousness. I trust his character. I trust his work ethic, and I think he'll figure this out. Yeah, agreed. Chris Berlin asked, Dan, the only question I have is this. The season starts Sunday. Does the coaching staff have the testicular fortitude to put the ball <laughs> in Jones' hand and let him sink or swim? What do you think? I think they're just going to try to win games. That's like what I think, and I don't know exactly what – the testicular fortitude would mean like, do you just want Daniel Jones to drop back 50 times? I don't think that's the optimal way to win football games. So I don't think the giants are going to allow him to do that unless they're forced to. Yeah. I don't think they're doing, I, there's a narrative that they're not doing much. The only thing I would say that they're not doing as far as letting him 
be him or letting him put the ball in his hands, whatever, you know, putting the ball in his hands, quote unquote, is not running enough quick game, but they can't even run that much more because then teams are going to key into it. Like they did first Garrett. But like, other than that, there are options on some of these plays that Nick and I have discussed and these whole shots are not being taken. So that's not on the coaches. That's on the quarterback. And more, more importantly, more times than not, at least recently, it's been on the protection. And so that also factors in too, right? If the protection is not there, how are you as a coaching staff in good faith going to let him sink or swim, quote unquote, by letting him throw 45 times a game when you don't trust your offensive line? And not only do you not trust your offensive line, when you actually ask them to do it, they're not performing well, right? So that's exactly. the big issue here. I still think the pass protection is the major issue as far as the pass game goes. And that's not going to get better anytime soon, in my opinion, um, at least not this season. It, it's, it might if, the, if they get a little healthier, but it's, it seems unlikely. So, no, I think they're going to continue to hide their weaknesses, their weaknesses being their pass protection and their lack of speed at receiver. Yeah, and I think that's probably the wise thing to do. Like, I don't think you're just going to be like, hey, we have to evaluate Jones. But add a little more quick game in, for sure. Yes, yes. And I think that's just something. I think Mike Kafka has already, like, at least shown us through the last two games that he he's going to attempt to do that. Right. And I hope that's what we see on Sunday. Muhammad Gasha asks, from a 30,000-foot view, what would you guys do at the quarterback position this offseason? Seeing that there are not more core pieces on the roster, would you further develop the roster or go all in on a rookie quarterback? Yeah, so this is another, I mean, we've answered a lot of this. I think where I lean now is what I said earlier. I don't really need to repeat it. I'm leaning toward re-signing Jones um, for a small deal and for not much cap allocated later. As far as would I go all in a rookie quarterback, I would have to tell you, I'd have to come back to you, Muhammad, because I haven't studied these guys yet, right? I don't really know. Um, so it's hard for me to say without watching them more. Personally. Same. Yeah. Yep. Same here. Okay. GPO Giants asks, do you still think there's any hope Jones can take that leap to franchise guy if he has a decent supporting cast? I think there's hope, but I don't necessarily think it's a given. And that's maybe another reason why you give him that quarterback friendly deal. If the Giants are in a position to land one of these quarterbacks coming out of the draft, but... I'm not convinced that he is the franchise guy. I think he's a guy who can win in the NFL if everything is around him is perfect, right? Or I would say well above average. I think that's fair to assess it that way. But is that necessarily what you want to build around and allocate that much of your cap to? Yeah, I think you nailed it. Look, it all comes down to what you think a franchise guy is. Do you think that Cousins, Carr, and Tannehill are franchise guys. If that's what you want, then that's a franchise guy. I think he has a ch he has definitely hope to become that. I still think, which is the only reason I want to resign him potentially, that he has hope to become even more than that. There's so much physical talent there with Jones, and I just I don't know. Maybe he can get better. Like to me, he has more physical talent than Kirk Cousins, slightly maybe, not more than Carr. Carr can really throw a ball, but he can run more than Carr, and and maybe more physical. Now Tannehill is pretty similar. Um, if not, Tannehill has a little bit more, but even so, like he can still get to a higher, he's had fewer, you know, years in the NFL. He had all those buried years of bad coaches and all the blah, blah, blah. But as far as become a franchise quarterback with a decent supporting cast, that's a better question. I would say probably unlikely. There's still some hope, but he needs a very good supporting cast to me to become a franchise quarterback. Like Nick said, Nick described it as perfect. I don't necessarily think it has to be perfect, but it has to be damn close probably. Yeah, I think well above average is the better way to uh, to describe it. So we have a nice question from Johnner Brotherin. Brethren? Brethren? I'm not sure. Should Jamie Gillen, a.k.a. the Scottish Hammer, the greatest punter nickname ever, be forced to revoke privileges to use said nickname? No, not really, because he's still hammering punts. Like, his issue is not hammering, though he did have the drop. That was, that was unfortunate, but... Hammering is not his issue. It's placing like he's dude just doesn't have good ball placement on his punts. Um, yeah, he's not precise. He's, he's not, precise. not precise. So he's a, he's definitely a hammer. He's not a screw. Yeah. You know, he's not a screwdriver. <laughs> he, he can't he can't get in the hole and then and then screw the damn thing in, bro. And that's that's a big issue with with Jamie Gillen, in my yeah. estimation, because you need to pin guys down into the 10 right. yard line, five yard line next to the pylon. And have we have really ever seen Gillen do that. In terms of like out of bounds, like there are times where the, no. the ball bounces and stays and then the punt yeah. coverage gets it, but it's definitely something that we need to see improve. He hasn't even really tried the punt like angle that abounds. It's weird. Yeah, it, like he puts the backspin on it though and it bounces yeah. at like the five yard line and hopefully it doesn't go into the end zone, stuff like that. Right. Okay. Quattro Quincy asks, Andrew Thomas and Evan Neal have appeared to struggle with speed off the edge in the last few weeks. There's been multiple instances where DNs have run around them and got pressure quickly. How can we counter this without leaving a running back in the backfield and or Bellinger to chip and release? 
I think quick game can certainly help yep. that. But I also, I would contend the point that Andrew Thomas has Me really too. struggled. He had the, I think both of Andrew Thomas's sacks have been from under center, single back, like seven step drops. Yeah. So it's just Andrew Thomas not getting to his set point. I don't think it's necessarily an issue with Andrew Thomas. He might've just misjudged it. I think those were, there's only two sacks that he has surrendered. I don't really see him getting beat around the edge too often when somebody does win high side, I feel like he does a great job flipping his hips, mirroring, and then just shoving the guy outside the pocket. And he didn't do it on the one sack. But again, that was a play that Mike Kafka doesn't run all that often. And Dan and I have said, we don't really appreciate or like that play because it does put those tackles into such a yes. vulnerable position. But in terms of Evan Neal, the chipping is a huge way, quick game, and also running the football. That's another, that's another big part of it. Have those edges, respect the run. And, uh, and hopefully slow down that pass rush. And also, if they want to run like that, that B gap comes open. Daniel Jones, use your legs. And we've seen right. that plenty this season. Yep. Nick nailed that one. I don't have anything further to add just because he completely nailed it. Uh, Smart One asks, what's the reason the Giants have so many injuries? For your information, this problem goes back to Coughlin. And I think it's the antiquated strength and conditioning program. Yeah, I don't really have too many opinions on the strength and conditioning program. It does seem like, though, really? I know exactly. Like, I, I can't really opine on that. It does seem like, though, the Giants are uh, injured frequently. Like, it does. I feel like the Chargers were a team that was like that for a while, right? Like, it was yeah. just like they couldn't get away from injuries. There's still a team like that. They lost Slater. They also lost a lineman. They're like mass, massive injuries there. Yeah, but I'm not going to sit here and call out the strength. I don't know shit about yeah. the strength and conditioning program. I don't either. And I think long injuries are mostly luck personally. So I'm just going to start start by saying that. But it, it does. It is weird. Like you said, smart one where like it's been happening for such a yeah. long, start, large sample size. Maybe it's not luck. I don't know, but we don't have anything to add on that. I mean, we're sitting here as giant fans, though, blaming the strength and conditioning. We're blaming the MetLife field. It, it, we're blaming a lot, but football is just a very violent yeah. Right. Sport at the same time is probably, you know, uh, the main reason why. <laughs> and like, look at what happened with Kyler Murray. You think he could have done anything different, strength and conditioning wise? No, he tore his ACL on an unlucky step that got caught in the turf and planted while he was planted. And that's that's now a year. He's down for a year or more. Like, it sucks, man. So it's just it's a lot of luck. Um, your boy asked, why is Nick Vanette on the roster? What does he do better than Tanner Hudson did? I think in theory, he's a better blocker. Yeah, than Tanner Hudson. And, and what we've seen, I would say he might have a slight edge, but we haven't necessarily seen Nick Vanette come in here and be Daniel Bellinger. So, and Nick Vanette's been in the league for quite a while, but I think the Giants are just trying to look for a solid 12 personnel option that can hold up and lose slowly enough. So far, we haven't necessarily seen it materialize, but I would say he's a little bit better than Tanner Hudson from what we've seen. Yeah, I think that's fair as far as blocking goes. I prefer with you. I'm with you, you boy. I'd rather have Tanner Hudson on the field personally. I'd like to have a little bit more speed in routes. Um, but it is what it is. Salon Queens asks Tremaine Edmonds, yes or no? Should we take a massive free agent swing on him? I think he's the best possible free agent signing the Giants could make in terms of meaningful impact for the next few years. Yeah, Tremaine Edmonds was drafted by the Joe Shane era up there in Buffalo, so he's quite familiar with the young man. But my thing is, I'm looking at contracts. I think he would have to command like an eleven million dollar a year contract. Like Matt Milano got ten point three. Zach Cunningham for the Titans got eleven million per year. Right. Do the Giants do that? Now I haven't paid close enough attention to Tremaine Edmonds' career to know if I would be fully comfortable with that right now. I do know that he is a good athlete. I know he was drafted at like twenty or something. Like he was really young when he was drafted. So oh no, sorry, so twenty years old. Yep. Yeah, so he might be like 24, 25 at the moment, and he's very long. So all of those physical traits they entice me but i would have to like watch his tape to really know so i would say i'm intrigued yeah i would agree with entirely everything you said i haven't watched his tape at all but i do know at least according to the pff he has a good grade but who knows what that means obviously <laughs> it's not worth much in, in our minds but we'll watch the tape and get back to you sal in theory i like the idea a lot but i want to make it clear if they are going to get a Tremaine Edwins or any of these guys in free agency it means no daniel jones and saquon barkley there is no world where they can keep jones Barkley, Andrew Tom with Andrew Thomas's contract looming, with Dexter Lawrence's contract looming, with Xavier McKinney's contract looming, and potentially Julian Love, and then also keep flowing in. I know some people think this is possible, but it's just not going to happen, and it's not really possible. So just keep that in mind when you consider it. And I'll say this. I would much rather have a Tremaine Edwins type in theory, if he is as good as you're saying, Sal, and if the film checks out, and go to the drawing board and find myself a Damien Pierce or Khalil Herbert in round three or four of an NFL draft at running back, then trying to find a linebacker like a Micah McFadden type in round three or four, and then 
re-signing Barkley. Just it is what it is. I think they have a much better chance to win moving forward without dumping all that money into an, uh, a running back with a massive injury history at a position that falls off at age 27 from a historical standpoint. So is what it is there, but that's just, that's just how it's going to be. Um, Elizabeth Contreras says, I'm not feeling very optimistic for a Giants win this Sunday. What do you guys think? Yeah, I wouldn't say I'm optimistic they're going to win. If I had to pick, I would probably side with Washington. They're coming off of a bye week. They're theoretically going to be more healthy. They got the game plan for the Giants three weeks in a row, and the Giants have not looked like they've had any sort of rhythm on offense for quite a few weeks. But I still think the Giants can win this football game. Just two weeks ago, the Giants had this team beat. If John Feliciano doesn't flex. If Darius Slayton holds on to a football, there were just so many ways where the Giants should have won that football game despite the fact that they fell down 10 nothing in the first quarter against the Washington football team, the commanders, whatever the hell you want to call them. So I would pick Washington, I think, spoiler alert. But I think the Giants, you know, they, they hold the cards right here. They have to come together. They have to establish offense and they have to stop the freaking run. You know, Scott Turner is going to call counter. They did it so much against right. the Giants and, and they were successful, not as successful as the Eagles, but they were successful. So, you know, I'm, I'm not optimistic. I'll tell you that much, but I think it's easily a winnable game too. Yeah. Brian Robinson was like five yards away from a hundred yard game against the Giants two weeks ago. Um, as far as what do I think? I think the Giants are going to have a good chance to win this game. I'm a little more optimistic than Nick is. I'm just not a huge fan of this Washington football team. Personally, I don't think they're that good, the commanders. Um, and I think the Giants played better than them and just made stupid, dumb mistakes to lose that first game. So it's only two weeks later. There are things working against them. The injuries, as you mentioned in the comment, Elizabeth, and the fact that Washington has two weeks to prepare for this game um, and the bye week to recover. It's not great. but I, I still- think this is going to tell a lot about Mike Kafka too. Cause remember the yeah. second half, the, the Washington, the commanders came out, they fumbled the football because Aziz Jolari had the strip sack and the giants scored that touchdown. And then they went, what I think like three, three and outs and then a four and out. They did nothing on offense whatsoever uh, in the second half of that game leading up to regular or the end of regulation when in overtime, they got a little bit of offense going. So I think now that you're game planning against this Jack Del Rio defense, Chase Young might be back. I'm really interested to see how Mike Kafka can try to get this offense sparked. And I think it could be telling as to what kind of offensive coordinator we have here in terms of making adjustments. Cause you just saw this team two weeks ago. True. Very good point, Nick. And that's something on that's something we can definitively say is on Mike Kafka. And so for those looking to assign blame or, or you know credit, that's where you can do it. All right, we're going to cut off there for this mailbag. There's still so many more questions left that we didn't get to, including Brian Heafy's. Uh, I want to shout you out, Brian, because I know you, you sent a big question via DM. We're going to, if you're good with it, Nick, and we'll talk after the pod, but we're going to try to find time tomorrow to record the rest of this as a mailbag part two. Um, still so many questions to get to, but for now, we're going to wrap it up there. Mailbag part one. Thanks to everyone tuning in to the Big Blue Banter podcast. Have a great rest of your week, and we will talk to you soon with mailbag part two.